Welcome to Cloud42, I'm James. Today I'm going to be starting a new project. It's a tool post grinder for my lathe. This is a big project and it's definitely going to be a multi-part series. I think today uh, we'll just look at the approach that I'm going to take and go through the design and then we'll start making some chips in part two. This is my lathe. This is a uh, benchtop model. It's a Grizzly G0602. It's about a 400 pound lathe, so it's a pretty decent lathe, but it's not huge, and it has a limited amount of space for a spindle. Probably the, the biggest constraint for uh, putting, a, putting any kind of spindle on this, a tool post grinder in particular, is that I really want the spindle to clear the compound because I plan on using it to uh, grind tapers, uh, especially you know tapers like for tool holding arbors, um, Morse tapers, ER collet tapers. I'll be building an ER collet chuck for this soon. And I want to be able to grind the inside surface where the collet seats. And so to do that, I will need to use the top slide set to the taper angle, which means that the spindle has to clear this. And if we look at the tool height over the top of this, there's not a lot of space to work with. So if I look at this, it's just barely over seven eighths of an inch, um, which means if I'm gonna if I'm gonna have a, sp a spindle across this, and I'm gonna be able to have enough material, maybe an eighth of an inch, hundred thousandths for a clamp to go around it and still clear the top of the top slide, then the radius of the spindle is gonna to have to be three quarters of an inch or less, which means I'm basically limited to an inch and a half diameter on the spindle. Um, I've spent a little bit of time trying to find tool post grinders that I could just buy. Most of them that are out there are too big for this lathe and wouldn't fit well. There are some that would, but they tend to be very, very expensive. Even, even really old, you know, like pre-war or been through the war looking uh, tool post grinders that are out there are even used, even ones that need, that are gonna definitely need $300 worth of bearings the moment you get them home, um, are still the better part of $1,000. So I don't, I don't think that's gonna be in my budget, so that's why I decided to go ahead and make one myself. Let's go over to the bench and take a look at the parts that I've gathered that I'm gonna start with, and then we'll take a look at the design. I spent a lot of time looking at different designs for grinder spindles, and I decided to start with an ER collet holder. Uh, this is what's called a C20 ER20A150L straight chuck collet holder. And all that means is that the C20 is the diameter of the shaft. It's a 20 millimeter straight shaft. It's an ER20A collet uh, holder at the end, and it's 150 millimeters long, a little over six inches. So this is a Chinese import. Uh, these are very inexpensive. I think this one cost about $12, including shipping. And uh, so it makes a great, it's very, very inexpensive way to start a project like this. Um, and you can see it's got the straight shank, which we're gonna put bearings on and use this as the, as the body of the spindle, the center core that spins. Um, and then it has a taper in the end and a collet nut, so you can put ER20 collets in here. And you can use that to hold inside grinding tools like mounted points or even another like ER16 or ER11 extension to be able to reach inside and do inside grinding. Um, the other thing I'm going to use it for is I want to build uh, grinding wheel arbors that will fit into this taper. And so as you can see, it's completely hollow all the way through. So it should be easy to make an arbor for a grinding wheel that fits that taper and is held in with a drawbar. So these are the bearings. Uh, bearing designation down here in the corner of the screen. Uh, these, I decided to go with rubber sealed um, deep groove ball bearings. Now the ideal bearings uh, that you're supposed to use for a spindle would be either um, angular contact ball bearings for a high speed spindle or uh, something like a tapered roller bearing for a slower speed, stronger spindle. And the problem that I ran into is because I'm trying to keep the outside of the spindle housing to an inch and a half or less, 
I just couldn't find readily available angular contact ball bearings that would fit into that kind of space. So I did a little bit of research and I think these bearings are going to work fine for this application. The, the real issue uh, with a, a deep groove sealed bearing relative to an angular contact bearing is the thrust loads, the axial loads on the bearing. And I think these are going to be okay. They should be rated for about 900 pounds radial dynamic load. So you figure about half that for the static load. So the, the radial static load should be about 500 pounds rated. And then with the deep groove bearing, you should figure the axial load is going to be about half that again. So uh, these should be able to handle at least 250 pounds axial load. There's going to be very little axial load on this since it's just going to be running a grinding wheel working on the side of the wheel. So this should be fine. Now these bearings have an outside diameter of 32 millimeters and inside diameter of 20. So in theory, they should just fit onto the shaft. In reality, it doesn't work that way because the bearing is very, very close to 20 millimeters and the outside of the shaft is very, very close to 20 millimeters. And so it's essentially a zero clearance or an interference fit. So I've already done some work on this in the lathe. I grabbed this end of it in a four jaw chuck and dialed it in for zero run out. And there is a small champ, 60 degree chamfer on the inside here. So I put a live center in the end and got this running true on the lathe. And then just used emery paper and scotch bright to just take this down ever so slightly. I mean, we're talking maybe one or two ten thousandths of an inch that had to come off of it. And once that's off of it, now I've got a very nice close fit on the bearings. You can't just force them on. You've got to feel them because it's really, really close. And you can see the bearing slides with some effort. Um, and it's, it's just, it's a very close fit on the, sh on the arbor. So the bearings are going to sit right about here. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a relief cut. Um, there's a relief cut right up here next to the uh, next to the collet holder, and that relief is just there as a part of the machining process to try to be able to get up to a square shoulder. But the square shoulder on this, because this is designed to be held in some kind of a tool holder for deep hole milling, um, they they weren't particularly concerned about the register on the end here. I am very concerned about that register because I want the, this to run true. So while I had it chucked up, you can see this, it's very, very shiny down in here. I um, hard turned a, a square register on that with a carbide tool. And this stuff is very, very hard. It's, it's like 55 uh, Rockwell C. And so that was particularly difficult. Before we're all done, um, I'm going to need, if the drawbar is going to go in here to get it to center perfectly, the inside of this isn't machined, so I'll end up hard boring a register on the inside of that as well. Now, the one thing that's a little bit odd about this particular unit is the, um, the thread. And you can see it's marked on here that the thread is uh, M24 by 1 millimeter. And that's really unusual. The usual thread. Let me grab another clamping nut from a, another tool holder here. Uh, for a standard ER20 is M25 by 1.5. And so it's, it's a little bit of an oddball. I mean, it came with the nuts, so it's not that big of a deal. But uh, standard ER20 collet nuts are not going to be interchangeable on this spindle. So this is what I'm going to start with for the spindle bore. And if you're interested in building one, the link for this will be down in the, in the video description. OK, let's see. Other parts that I've got. Uh, motor. Um, I have this motor. This is about a quarter horsepower max 40 volt motor. This should be uh, sufficient. Spins at 3,400 RPM. So if I want to run the grinder spindle faster than that, I'm thinking you know, maybe 6,400. Uh, 6800 for, um, for a starting point for testing this, um, then I'm going to need a two to one belt drive. And this is the belt that I'm planning on using. This is what's called a poly V belt. Let me see if I can get, see if you can see this. Um, if you see, it's got two V sections on the belt. It's, uh, it's like a V-belt, but it's actually got two teeth. So we'll have to turn a custom pulley for this or custom set of pulleys 
that have the uh, appropriate uh, contour for this. And it's, a, uh, it's called a Poly V J series belt. So this is a 140 J2, which means it's J series, has two ribs, and it's 14 inches in diameter, or excuse me, in circumference. I do not know why they measure the circumference of these in inches when all of the dimensions for the design are in millimeters, but that's apparently how they do that. Then for the bearings, I don't, I don't want them just free floating. And there's gonna be some heat generated during grinding and heat generated from the bearings. So I need to have a little bit of play in the bearings to be able to allow, um, allow expansion. But I don't want to allow this to float free because I'm afraid it'll chatter. So I am gonna preload the bearings and this is what I'm planning to use. These are Belleville washers that are designed specifically for preloading this size of bearing. So the inside bore is 20.4 millimeters, the outside is just under 32, like 31.8. And um, you can see it's slightly cupped. You can see if I can pop this, if you can see it. So this provides a little bit of spring force when it's squeezed in the assembly, it fits against the bearing so that it provides pressure only on the inside race, and there's a little bit of space here on the outside. So when this is compressed, it'll squeeze the inner races, the bearing together, and provide a preload. Again, the, the total uh, load rating for these bearings axial should be around 250 pounds, and this will provide about a 15-pound preload, which should be just enough to take out all the slack and still allow it to run smoothly. Okay, the last thing that I have here is a grinding wheel. Now this is a half inch wide, four inch grinding wheel. And this is just what I could find that's available. I think a three inch wheel might be a better fit for this, but I'm ultimately gonna make arbors for the wheels that clamp through the wheel and, and lock on and so that there's one arbor per wheel and it's permanently attached. And then it has a taper on it that will fit into the end of the spindle. So that is the plan. Um, let's go over to the computer and let me show you the design. This is Fusion 360 and this is what I started the design with. This is a model of the uh, ER20 collet holder that I used. You can uh, turn a cross section here so you can see it's bored through and then has the taper in the front and the threads to hold on the collet nut, which I also modeled but isn't really important for this. So if you look at the shape of this thing, we've got a cylindrical shank to hold the bearings, but there's a, a relief cut up here at the front near the shoulder. And the reason they do that is so that they don't have to grind a sharp inside corner. They can grind this shaft without actually running the side of the wheel up against anything. Now, um, I actually do need that to be a square shoulder so that everything can register. So I did turn that, but I can't run the bearing all the way up there. So I'm gonna have to have some kind of a spacer um, so I uh, have a spacer that will go there in the design to space the bearing off and then ultimately we're going to have two uh, bearings on the shaft and those are as I mentioned earlier 37 millimeter outside diameter 20 millimeter inside diameter now to hold these uh, the first part we're probably going to end up making is the spindle housing and this is just an inch and a half diameter piece of uh, mild steel uh, turned around inch and a half and then bored out with registers to hold the bearings um, for, for the spindle. And then to hold those in, there are threaded caps that fit over that on the end. And so the way this works is that the bearing goes in and then the cap threads over it, locking the outer race of the bearing to the spindle body, leaving the inside race free to turn and the seals, which are kind of exaggerated here, don't turn, so they won't rub on anything. Only that inner race is gonna turn. And then there's just enough clearance. I think it's a half, um, excuse me, I can't remember. I think it's half a millimeter that I left clearance between the spacer and the, and the lock ring. And that should be plenty for it to spin freely, but kind of reduce the risk of contamination. Ultimately, in the long run, I could always make new spacers that have flanges and create kind of a labyrinth seal situation here. Okay, so then on the back side of the spindle, we have exactly the same thing, the other bearing and, the, uh, and another cap. Now, 
that leaves the spindle free to slide in and out. So to lock it on, there's ultimately a pulley on the back here, and there's another spacer as well. But I want to preload the bearings, and I don't want to do it rigidly because as the temperature of the inside of the spindle changes, or the, you know, the temperature of the system changes, the materials expand and contract. And so it'll be very difficult if this is rigid to actually control the preload on the bearings. So what I'm going to use is a Belleville spring, and that's just a, you know, a, a cupped washer. And this should provide about uh, 15 pounds of force, so I can adjust it by compressing the motor pulley in, and it compresses that Belleville washer, putting force on the inside bearing race, which then locates the spindle accurately. Okay, so then to drive all this thing, we've of course got the motor. And of course, I can't find the motor in here. There it is. And a motor pulley and a belt. And the idea here is to run this at about a two to one uh, speed increase. So that the motor's spinning at 3,400 RPM and I get about 6,800 RPM on the grinder. And you can very easily see here the cross section of this uh, Poly V uh, J series belt with two ribs to drive it. Now to mount the motor, there's a number of solutions we could use here. And what I decided to do is just go with a clamp. And so this clamp, uh, if I turn off the cross section, you can kind of see what's going on here. This clamp is made out of three quarter inch thick aluminum plate. It's, it's sized to fit around the spindle and around the motor, and it has two screws in it to clamp it on this split. Now, if I clamp the motor rigidly like this, then I have no way of adjusting the belt tension. So I opted to go with an eccentric design. I've seen a couple of other designs that work this way. And this is just a ring that's bored off-center that goes around the motor and goes into the, the hole in the clamp. And then it's got a little split in it right here to allow it to compress down on the motor. The idea here is that the motor is actually five millimeters off center. So by rotating that ring, I can move the motor up and down closer or further away from the spindle by about 10 millimeters, which should give me plenty of adjustability to adjust the tension on the belt. Okay, then to mount this whole thing onto the lathe, I need a way to clamp the spindle and mount it. And I opted to go, I have an AXA tool holder on the lathe, and I opted to go with an AXA tool post clamp. So this is just a block that's bored out to accept the inch and a half spindle. It's split and has a couple of screws in it to clamp that down. And then on the back side, it has the geometry for the AXA wedge type uh, tool post. So this will drop right onto the tool post. It's got a height adjuster on a set screw with a lock nut and a little wavy washer to um, allow that to be adjusted for height. And this should block it directly onto the, the tool post. And as we measured over on the lathe, we've got about a hundred thousandths between the bottom of the spindle and the bottom of the block, so that should all clear over the top of the um, or of the top slide. So that should be fine. And that's the overall design. Uh, when we're doing inside grinding, I can just put the ER20 collet nut on here and use collets and mounted points, or even extension tool holders to reach inside for grinding. But for outside grinding. Uh, we need a way to hold a wheel. And the idea here is, let me bring up a three by three eighths inch wheel here. The idea is to make an arbor that locks into the grinding wheel and fits into the taper in the end of the, of the spindle. Bring up the cross section here so you can see what's going on. So this is a solid uh, piece of material that's used for the spindle. It's bored on its uh, size to fit inside the grinding wheel to be as close a fit as possible, and then there's a flange that screws on with uh, pin spanners, pin spanner holes in the front and in the back. And that's threaded so that you can clamp the grinding wheel on. The idea being that you make one of these, um, one of these uh, arbors for every grinding wheel, and then once the wheel is dressed and trued, it, will, it can be repeatedly taken out of the uh, out of the spindle and put back in, and it should recenter and shouldn't need to be retrued, even though, you know, it, reality being what it is, you may want to take a light cut on it. Now, since this is an ER20 collet, 
uh, design. This is an eight degree taper. It's not self-locking. So we also, of course, need a draw bar. And the draw bar will just be turned up from drill rod or you know whatever kind of material um, I have available. It, there's not gonna be a lot of force on it. I'm just gonna want it to be con as concentric as possible so that it spins smoothly. And to that end, I want it to register in the backside of the spindle so that the, the end of it is not wobbling around. So as I've shown in this design, I plan to actually hard bore out uh, a little bit on the end of the, uh, uh, the spindle here. The, the collet holder is not ground on the inside, it's just drilled out. And so it's not concentric, so I'll need to check this up in the four jaw, indicate it, and do a little bit of a bore on the inside. This is really hard material, but it, it will cut with carbide. And that'll give me a register, and then when I make the draw bar, I'll just, uh, I'll just size it to fit that with you know half a thou to a thou clearance, so it'll just be a nice sliding fit. Or if that's too tight, I'll loosen it up a little bit. So this is the design. At least this is an overview of the design. Uh, from this, I put together a set of drawings, and we'll use those drawings to go make all the parts and build the tool post grinder. As you can see, there are a lot of small parts to make out of a variety of different materials. I think I'm going to start with the spindle housing in the next video, and uh, then work on the bearing caps to fit that. Uh, so stay tuned for that. There are a lot of directions I could go with these videos. I could keep them to just the machining. I could spend more time talking about the design. I could walk through the entire modeling process in Fusion 360. Um, I don't know what you guys would find interesting. Go ahead and uh, let me know in the comments what you'd like to see. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the rest of the series. Thank you for watching.